The man known to history as Emperor Haile Selassie I was born on the 23rd of July 1892 in the town of Ejaz Sogoro, not far from the city of Harar in Ethiopia. He was given the name Lij Tavari Makonen in his youth. Lij simply means child of, while Tavari means one who is respected or feared. Makonen was his father's name, and so, as he was growing up, he was known as the child of Makonen, who is greatly respected. His father, Ras Makonen, was the governor of the ancient walled city of Harar in eastern Ethiopia, and a key advisor to his near kinsman, Emperor Menelik II, who was emperor at the time. Thus, Lich Tavari Makonen was born into a significant noble family which was related to the current imperial dynasty. Through his paternal grandmother, Tafari was descended from the Solomonic line of kings, who had ruled this part of Africa since the 13th century. Tafari's mother was Boizero Yeshimebet Ali, the daughter of a ruling chief from Wolo province to the north. Any exploration of Tafari's life must start by exploring the nature of Ethiopian society and the empire that ruled it in the late 19th century. Ethiopia and the wider Horn of Africa have a unique history. 1700 years ago, when the Roman Empire ruled all of North Africa, Roman Egypt emerged as a major early center of Christianity in the Eastern Mediterranean. Soon, the new religion spread south beyond the borders of the Roman Empire, down the River Nile and the coast of the Red Sea. It gained many adherents in what is now Ethiopia, which effectively became a Christian country. However, with the Arab conquests of the Middle East and North Africa in the 7th century AD, Ethiopia was effectively cut off from the rest of the Christian world, but it did not convert to Islam. Accordingly, over the centuries, a unique form of Christianity developed here, one which continued to adhere to many of the rites which were typical of the 4th century church. Moreover, Ethiopian politics and culture became shrouded in biblical legend, and from the 13th century onwards, the rulers of the kingdom of Ethiopia claimed to be descended from the biblical king Solomon. Therefore, their dynastic line has become known as the Solomonic dynasty. This Solomonic dynasty ruled a kingdom which centuries ago only constituted part of northern Ethiopia. But between the 13th and 19th centuries, it began expanding to the south, west and east eventually covering an area approximate to modern-day Ethiopia. As it did so, the Ethiopian Empire became a multicultural state, one which had many different ethnic peoples living under the rule of the emperors. The foremost of these were the Oromo and Amhara people, who between them made up over half the population of the empire. But significant minorities included the Somalis in the far south and east of the country and the Tigrayans in the northeast. These different ethnicities spoke different languages and had somewhat different appearances. For instance, the Oromo are a Cushitic people who dominated the northwestern part of the country and had been more responsive to the spread of Islam into the region. The Amhara are a Semitic people who dominated the highlands of Ethiopia and were much more committed to Oriental Orthodox Christianity. These ethnic and religious divisions would influence Selassie's rule and indeed the entire history of modern Ethiopia. Indeed, so central are they to the country's history that the alternative name which was used for the Ethiopian Empire at the time of Tafari's birth was Abyssinia, from the Arabic Habasa term for mixture, a reference to the multicultural nature of the empire. By the mid-19th century, the Ethiopian Empire had become one of the most powerful states in Africa, and it needed to be. For the great European powers were entering into a period of accelerated colonization of the continent. To the north, Egypt had effectively become a British protectorate, and British rule was being extended down the River Nile into Sudan, Ethiopia's western neighbor, and eventually into Uganda and Kenya, the southern neighbors of Abyssinia. To the east of Abyssinia, along the coastline of the Horn of Africa, a number of European powers acquired territory through treaties and military intervention in the years leading up to Tafari's birth. The foremost of these was the Kingdom of Italy, which acquired the colonies of Italian Somaliland and Eritrea in the 1880s, comprising most of the modern-day countries of Eritrea and Somalia. 
the British and French also carved out small enclaves in northern Somaliland. In the end, nearly all of Africa was annexed by the European powers in what has become known as the Scramble for Africa. However, Abyssinia avoided this fate, in large part because Emperor Benelik II, who came to power in 1889, began a program of modernization. He established Addis Ababa as a strong new capital in the center of the empire and developed an alliance with the Russian Empire from 1893 onwards. Through this, the Russians sent military advisors, scientists and economists to Abyssinia to advise the country on how to modernize its government, economy and military, with a view to withstanding encroachments by the Italians, British, French and others. Thus, when Tafari was born in 1892, a new era of Ethiopian history was beginning. As a son of a major Ethiopian noble, Tafari was afforded honors from a young age. For instance, when he was just 13 years old, he was given the title of Dejaz Mach of Gara Mulata, an administrative region near the city of Harar. Dejaz Mach literally means keeper of the door and shows that he was a protector of sorts of the region, while still barely a teenager. Yet, there was little sign at this time that he would ascend to a position of imperial authority. For, despite the fact that he was related to the imperial family, Emperor Menelik II had a clear line of succession in place. He had two daughters, Sharega and Zeuditu. Through these, Menelik had several grandsons, one of whom, Lij Iyasu, the son of Sharega, was eventually designated by Menelik as his successor. Meanwhile, Tafari's youth also saw a concerted effort by the Kingdom of Italy to connect its two colonies of Eritrea and Somaliland by conquering Abyssinia. In 1895, the Italians invaded Abyssinia, but Emperor Menelik's modernization efforts proved beneficial, and the short-lived First Italo-Ethiopian War ended a year later in 1896, when an Italian invasion force of some 15,000 men were decisively defeated by a much larger Ethiopian army of upwards of 75,000 at the Battle of Adwa. With this, Abyssinia's independence was secured for a generation. In his teenage years, Tafari was promoted further within the empire. In 1907, for instance, he was appointed as a governor of the province of Sidamo in the south of Ethiopia. He sired a daughter during this time, the future Princess Romanwok, though the identity of her mother is not entirely certain. In 1911, he married Menen Asfau, also a member of the imperial family. This was around the time when Emperor Menelik II, who was nearing his 70th year, became increasingly more incapacitated due to a series of strokes he had suffered. He eventually died in 1913, leaving his 18-year-old grandson, Liju Yasu, as the emperor-designate. Yasu had been serving as de facto emperor for some time by 1913, on account of his grandfather's illness. Under such circumstances, this might have allowed him to solidify his position in advance of the emperor's death, but instead the direct opposite had occurred. Yasu had found himself increasingly opposed by the council of ministers which his grandfather had established and even by his own aunt, Menelik's younger daughter, Princess Zeuditu. Thus, when Menelik finally died in December 1913, the Council of Ministers and the Princess suppressed news of his passing and did not confirm Yasu as the new emperor. He was left to enjoy some semblance of power in the months that followed, but his accession would never be proclaimed and he would never be given an imperial name. There were multiple reasons for this opposition to Yasu. Firstly, in the final years of Menelik's reign, the young prince had shown himself disinclined to the kind of administration and management which was necessary for the ruler of a rapidly modernizing empire. Secondly, and more importantly, there were concerns that he was disposed to Islam over the Christian faith, which was central to Ethiopian political life. The latter issue was unacceptable to the Council of Ministers, and when rumors that Yasu had converted to Islam mounted in the mid-1910s, they moved to depose him as emperor in the autumn of 1916. He was placed under arrest and would spend the rest of his life down to the mid-1930s in detention. Following his removal from power, Zeuditu was proclaimed as Empress of Ethiopia. But with the succession now unsure, it was decided that her cousin, Lij Tavari Makonen, 
the future Emperor Haile Selassie would be appointed as her regent and designated successor. Evidently, Tafari's tenure as a regional governor of several provinces in the late 1900s and into the 1910s had been successful, and he had weathered the political intrigue of the years of Yasu's brief reign very well. Thus, the stage was set for Tafari to one day succeed Zoditu, who was entering her forties when she became empress and did not have any other clear successor. In the years that followed, a clear delineation developed within the government of Abyssinia between Empress Zuditu and the regent Tafari. She was a traditionalist and a conservative ruler, while he was following the path hewn by Emperor Menelik II in wishing to modernize Ethiopia. In theory, the empress was by far the more powerful figure, but her position was weaker than any of her predecessors as ruler of Abyssinia for the simple reason that she was a woman in a society which prioritized male rule. As such, Tafari was able to claim a great deal more influence than would have been typical of the power dynamic between them in most other circumstances. Both had their factions. She was favored by the Ethiopian church, which looked kindly on her conservative values, while Tafari was supported by a clear majority of the Council of Ministers. Eventually, in the course of the 1920s, he emerged as the more powerful figure, and long before her rule would end, Zodito had begun to withdraw from government and allowed Tafari to continue his modernization efforts in the 1920s. The modernization program, which was implemented in the 1920s, was multifaceted. Much of it centered on trying to modernize the government and administration of Abyssinia to make it more like those of the European powers. There was a precedent for this. The non-European power which had modernized most effectively in the 19th century was the Empire of Japan. It had done so by adopting Western methods and had thus resisted Western encroachments and established itself as a major power itself in the Far East by the 1920s. Abyssinia aimed to at least partially emulate this approach. Thus, a Western-style government was established by Tafari, one with ministers responsible for individual aspects of governance. In tandem, there was a move away from the feudal nature of Ethiopian government to a political system where individuals were promoted based on their abilities rather than their noble rank. Finally, Abyssinia applied for membership in the newly established League of Nations, a forerunner of the United Nations. It became a member in 1923, one of the few non-Western nations to ever become a member of the League. Even more significant were the attempted economic and social reforms which were introduced during the reign of Empress Zoditu and the Regency of Tafari. Already the first electricity grids had been introduced to Addis Ababa in the mid-1910s, and this was expanded outwards in the 1920s. At the same time, efforts were initiated to begin linking the main cities with roads and eventually railway lines. The telegraph and other communication systems, which had become commonplace in the Western world in the second half of the 19th century, also finally arrived to Abyssinia, albeit in a limited fashion. The National Bank of Ethiopia was founded in 1927 to bolster the economy and excessive lending rates were prohibited. Perhaps most importantly, the judicial system was overhauled with the Feta Negas Law Code, a legal system which had been used in Ethiopia for centuries and which imposed brutal punishments for moderate crimes, such as the loss of a hand for being found guilty of theft, was gradually phased out in favor of a Western judicial system based on elements of the civil and common law. But there was a major backward element to Abyssinian society which remained. Slavery was still widespread here, a century after it had been prohibited throughout much of the Western world. Tokenistic efforts were made to end this in the 1920s as the Western powers criticized the retention of the system in Ethiopia, but Tafari was unwilling to commit to any major efforts to eliminate it from Abyssinian society at this time. Meanwhile, Tafari's international reputation was growing, and by the end of the 1920s, he was increasingly viewed as the face of Abyssinia on the world stage rather than the Empress. Much of this was owing to numerous trips abroad and state visits. For instance, in 1924, he undertook a tour of numerous foreign capitals and major cities with other members of the extended imperial family and the government, 
This was a fact-finding mission as much as anything else, as Tafari and others sought to gain from direct experience of the Western societies they were attempting to emulate. The Abyssinian delegation, with its ostentatious displays of wealth and court ritual, made a significant impression in London and Paris, where Tafari met King George V and the French Prime Minister, Raymond Poincaire. Another significant goal of this foreign tour was to try to convince the British and French governments to provide Abyssinia with access to the Red Sea by surrendering some territory in its colonial enclaves in Somaliland. Elsewhere, in the Middle East and North Africa, Tafari was greeted warmly as the all but head of state of virtually the only African nation which had withstood European colonization in the 19th century. All of this ensured that, before he would ever become emperor, Tafari was well established on the international stage. By 1928, Tafari's position at home in Abyssinia was such that the Empress could not but promote him ever further. By this time, he had monopolized power within the Council of Ministers and, more importantly, had also moved to secure the loyalty of the heads of the military and police forces. Thus, on the 7th of October 1928, he was crowned as Negus, an Abyssinian title equivalent to a king, though still below that of Emperor or Empress. This replaced his earlier honorific of Ras, which had signified his position within the imperial line. In the months that followed, tensions began to brew between the Empress's faction and that of Tafari, ultimately culminating in January 1930 in the outbreak of a borderline civil war between Tafari and Gugsawela, the Empress's husband. He not only wished to reassert his wife's authority within the empire, but now had designs of replacing Tafari as the head of the government and having himself crowned as emperor. Guxawela's rebellion culminated in a major meeting of his forces and the supporters of Tafari at the Battle of Anchem on the 31st of March 1930. But with their superior Western armaments and methods, which included the use of modern aircraft, Tafari's supporters quickly defeated Gugsawela's army. He himself was killed in the fighting. Then, in a seemingly unconnected development, the Empress died of natural causes just two days later, clearing the way for Tafari to claim absolute power in Abyssinia after years of dual rule between him and the Empress. A mourning period of over half a year was imposed following the passing of Empress Zeuditu. But at last, on the 2nd of November 1930, Tafari was proclaimed as the new emperor of Abyssinia and crowned that same day at the Cathedral of St. George in Addis Ababa. Emissaries from many Western nations attended the event, and Tafari featured on the cover of Time magazine that November. He also adopted a new name and title. The title he obtained was now Negusa Nagast, the King of Kings, while his imperial name would be Haile Selassie. Haile means power of, and Selassie means trinity, so the name Haile Selassie effectively means the power of the trinity. However, as we will see later, the former name he bore for much of the 1920s, Rastafari, was to gain currency again in later years and become increasingly well-known globally. More immediately, in the early 1930s, just after his accession as Emperor Haile Selassie I, the new ruler of Ethiopia quickly oversaw the introduction of Ethiopia's first modern constitution in 1931. This provided for the establishment of a bicameral legislature, with a parliament and an upper house of lords, with whom the emperor would share power. It was also intended that a new constitution would further lead to the end of the Feta Nagest legal system and its replacement with a Western judicial code. The first years of Selassie's reign as emperor were marked by his efforts to continue and expand the modernization program he had first initiated as regent in the 1920s. However, a shadow was increasingly hanging over Ethiopia. Back in 1922, the Italian government had been taken over by the National Fascist Party led by Benito Mussolini after the infamous march on Rome by 30,000 paramilitary fascist blackshirts. One of Mussolini's great desires was to build Italy into a great power again and to resurrect the empire Italians had enjoyed back in the days of Rome two millennia earlier. To that end, in the 1920s, he had engaged in a series of aggressive actions 
initiating a brutal war of conquest in Libya, which had been a nominal colony of Italy's since 1912, as well as bombing the island of Corfu during a dispute with the Kingdom of Greece, annexing the city of Fiume in what is now Croatia and establishing a protectorate over Albania through a series of treaties in the mid-1920s. With these advances made, in the early 1930s, Mussolini's attentions turned to the Horn of Africa, where he increasingly wished to correct what he deemed to be an historical failing of Italy's, its loss to Ethiopia in the first Italo-Ethiopian War back in the 1890s. If Abyssinia could be conquered, it would also make a continuous colony of Italy's lands in Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Italian Somaliland, in turn making it the predominant colonial power in the Horn of Africa. In 1934, tensions between Selassie's government and the Italian colonial administration in Eritrea and Somaliland began to flare over a long-running boundary dispute which had been caused by Italy's wish to build a railway line through the region connecting its two divided colonies, which Ethiopia was in the middle of. This had culminated in Italy building a military fort at Walwal in eastern Ethiopia. In December 1934, the Italian presence here was challenged by Selassie's government when Abyssinian troops were sent to Walwal. On the 5th of December, this led to violent engagements between the Italians and the Ethiopians, resulting in dozens of deaths on both sides. An international diplomatic standoff followed, now known as the Abyssinia Crisis. In early January 1935, Selassie's government protested to the League of Nations. Months of diplomatic toing and froing would follow, but essentially the British and French governments, who were best placed to act as intermediaries, were unwilling to block Italian aggression at a time when they were trying to win over Mussolini as an ally in Europe, in the face of the rise of the Nazis following Adolf Hitler's seizure of power in Germany in 1933. Consequently, while negotiations followed for months, it eventually became clear to Selassie's government that the Italians were intent on using the Walwal incident in December 1934 and the ensuing diplomatic standoff as an excuse to declare war on Abyssinia and that the League of Nations was not going to take any effective measures to try to stop Mussolini's aggression. The Second Italo-Abyssinian War commenced on the 3rd of October 1935, when the Italian general Emilio di Bono crossed over the border from Italy's colony of Eritrea into northern Ethiopia with tens of thousands of Italian troops. There was no formal declaration of war. This was to be one of the most significant conflicts globally during the interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War, eventually involving hundreds of thousands of troops and personnel on both sides. It would last for just over a half a year. The sides were evenly matched throughout, though. While the Ethiopians were numerically superior, despite the best efforts to modernize their army since the 1890s, their forces were still resoundingly based on mass infantry divisions. For instance, Selassie's government had just a handful of tanks, and the Ethiopian Air Force consisted of little more than a dozen planes. By way of contrast, Mussolini's government was eventually able to deploy hundreds of tanks in East Africa, as well as massive artillery barrages and a significant air force presence. Thus, while the Italian army would be shown in later years to be enormously deficient in European terms, the war which was initiated in the autumn of 1935 was clearly a David versus Goliath type conflict in which the Italians had the upper hand in a way which they had not back in 1895 when the first Italo-Ethiopian war was launched. In response to the invasion of Abyssinia, the League of Nations sanctioned Italy on the 7th of October 1935, four days after the initial incursion by de Bono's troops. The two primary countries within the League to whom the responsibility fell for challenging the Italian government's actions were Britain and France, who were the foremost colonial powers across the African continent and who had colonies nearby themselves in Somaliland and all across Ethiopia's western and southern borders in Sudan and Kenya in the case of Britain. Yet while the conservative-led national government of Stanley Baldwin in Britain campaigned on and won an election in November 1935 on the premise of supporting the League of Nations and its mission, Baldwin's government almost immediately capitulated to Italian aggression. Within days of arriving in office, 
the new British Foreign Secretary Samuel Hoare was engaged in talks with his French counterpart Pierre Laval, who was also the French Prime Minister at the time, about how the war could be quickly brought to an end. Here, the desire to appease Italy and prevent it from drifting closer to Nazi Germany was paramount, and the Hoare-Laval Pact, details of which were leaked by the British press in early December, effectively outlined a plan whereby Abyssinia would lose roughly half of its territory to Italy, allowing the Italians to connect their colonies of Eritrea and Somaliland. This was completely unacceptable to Selassie's government and a complete betrayal of the mandate of the League of Nations. Outrage followed. Hoare resigned as British Foreign Minister and ultimately the revelation of details of the pact brought to an end any efforts to find a diplomatic solution to the conflict. The Hoare-Laval Pact and the wider Abyssinia crisis is generally seen as also sounding the death knell of the League of Nations, an institution which had now conclusively proven its inability to prevent aggressive nations like Italy and the Empire of Japan from invading its enemies with no justification. With the termination of diplomatic negotiations in December 1935, the war intensified on the ground in Abyssinia. By now, the Ethiopian government was making preparations for its own counter-offensive against the Italian incursion in the north. This was led by Selassie in person and had hoped to sever the Italian lines of communication and launch a counter-invasion of Eritrea. Initially, it met with considerable success, but in the early months of 1936, the tide turned once General Pietro Badoglio, who had previously overseen the Italian campaign in Libya, was appointed as governor of Eritrea and the leader of the military effort in succession to De Bono, whose oversight of the invasion had been deemed too cautious by Mussolini. Badoglio initiated a brutal campaign in January 1936, in which poison gas was widely used against the Ethiopian armies. Through these methods, a series of victories were quickly won by Badoglio at the battles of Tembien, Amba Aradam and Shire in northern Ethiopia in the late winter and early spring of 1936. A final effort to maintain the northern front by Selassie was defeated at the Battle of Mechu on the 31st of March 1936, following which northern Ethiopia was effectively under Italian control. On the 26th of April 1936, Badoglio launched what he termed the March of the Iron Will a swift drive southwards from the northern front around Desi in Wallo province towards the Abyssinian capital of Addis Ababa, a distance of some 200 kilometers. The campaign was accompanied by much fanfare and propaganda in the fascist media back home in Italy. A large mechanized column was the centerpiece of this drive, with over 2,000 tanks, cars, trucks and other vehicles included in the operation, which transported some 12,500 Italian troops speedily towards Selassie's capital. By now, the Ethiopian armies were decimated from the northern offensive, and as the Italians neared Addis Ababa in early May, the emperor and his family fled from the capital and made their way towards the border with French Somaliland, crossing over as Selassie went into what would be years of exile from his realm. Three days later, at roughly 4 p.m. on the afternoon of the 5th of May, 1936, Badoglio arrived in Addis Ababa at the front of a column of 1,700 vehicles. In the hours that followed, Italian troops began entering the city in what was more of a procession than an actual siege and occupied prominent buildings all over the capital. The war was now effectively over. The Second Italo-Ethiopian War came to an end in May 1936 with the fall of Addis Ababa and the flight of Emperor Haile Selassie from Ethiopia. However, pockets of resistance remained, particularly in the south and west of the country, which were still unoccupied by any Italian forces. Accordingly, fighting would continue for months and years to come. Indeed, all of Abyssinia was never actually brought under effective Italian control. Yet, from May 1936, the Italian government claimed to have won the war. As such, the new colony of Italian Ethiopia was declared to be in existence by Mussolini on the 9th of May 1936. However, this was soon annexed into the newly proclaimed colony of Italian East Africa, which incorporated Abyssinia, Eritrea, 
and Italian Somaliland, and which stretched all the way across the Horn of Africa, completing the ambition for Italy to create a contiguous colony here 40 years after it had first been attempted in the mid-1890s. Here, the Italians would impose a brutal form of colonial governance, following many of the quasi-genocidal policies which had been developed in Libya in the 1920s of confining thousands of people to concentration camps and favoring a divide-and-rule policy, whereby the different ethnic peoples of Ethiopia were pitted against each other. With the Italians now largely in control of his country, Emperor Selassie made his way to Europe. His first mission was to present Abyssinia's case at the League of Nations in Geneva. However, his timing was far from propitious. In Europe, Nazi Germany had initiated an aggressive program of military rearmament in 1935, and in the spring of 1936, while Selassie was fighting in northern Ethiopia, Hitler had ordered his troops into the Rhineland of Western Germany, which German troops had been prevented from entering under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that brought the First World War to an end. Consequently, the governments of Britain and France were no more willing to adopt an aggressive stance against Italy in 1936 than they had been the previous autumn. Nevertheless, while his efforts at redress were in vain, Selassie gained acclaim for a speech he made at a meeting of the League on the 12th of May 1936, in the course of which he denounced the rise of fascism and the use of poison gas by the Italians in East Africa. He was subsequently named Time Magazine's Man of the Year, but the result for Ethiopia was the same. The League was unwilling to take concerted action against Italy, which in any event withdrew from membership of it in December 1937. Meanwhile, Selassie headed for England where he would live in exile throughout the late 1930s. While he was in exile in England, the world's politics was in continual flux. Germany's aggression intensified in 1938 with the annexation of Austria and then Czechoslovakia in 1939. When the Nazis invaded Poland the following September, Britain and France declared war, triggering the start of the Second World War. For the time being, Mussolini adopted a cautious stance and did not enter the war. But when the Germans undertook a blistering military campaign in the summer of 1940 that effectively brought continental Western Europe under Berlin's control, the Italians decided to side with Hitler, declaring war on Britain and France on the 10th of June 1940 and invading southeastern France in an effort to acquire territory there. What this now meant was that the Italians and the British would square off to each other in East Africa. On the 13th of June 1940, an Italian air raid was launched against British Kenya in the first action of the East Africa campaign. This was all part of a wider Italian initiative to conquer Britain's colonies in Egypt and Sudan, and thus unite Italian East Africa with Italy's growing expanse of territory in North Africa. At first, these campaigns proceeded well for Mussolini, but by early 1941, the weaknesses of the Italian military were becoming wholly apparent. Early in 1941, with Italian operations in the Sahara Desert faltering, Mussolini called on Hitler for aid. A German expeditionary force, the famous Africa Corps, led by Erwin Rommel, was dispatched to North Africa that March, but there would be no major military support offered to the Italian position in East Africa. Thus, in the course of 1941, the British gradually turned the tide here and began pushing the Italians back into Ethiopia and Eritrea after their initial advances into Sudan and Kenya. By this time, Selassie had left Britain and had returned to the Horn of Africa to oversee parts of the campaign to reclaim his homeland from the Italians himself. The fighting here was undertaken by a broad mix of British, Ethiopian, Eritrean, Free French and Free Belgian forces. Crucially, they had naval superiority, and by early 1941, a new front was being opened in Eritrea following a naval operation in the Red Sea. As a result, by the late spring of 1941, the Italian defence was collapsing on all fronts as the troops in East Africa found themselves effectively cut off from major reinforcement by Mussolini's government. Finally, on the 5th of May 1941, in an event which was stage-managed to occur exactly five years after Badoglio had arrived with his Italian forces to Addis Ababa, 
Selassie re-entered the capital of Ethiopia and proclaimed the liberation of the country from Italy. The restoration of the Solomonic dynasty and Emperor Haile Selassie to power in Ethiopia carried a proviso from the British who had largely restored the emperor to power. Slavery had to be banned entirely in Ethiopia. There had been piecemeal efforts at doing so as far back as the 1850s, at which time Britain was using its influence as the global superpower of the 19th century to try to curb the slave trade across Africa. These had intensified under Emperor Menelik II and during Selassie's time as regent back in the 1920s, but slavery had never fully been eradicated in Ethiopia and was still a feature of Ethiopian society when the Second Italo-Ethiopian War was initiated in 1935. Following the conquest, the Italians had declared the abolition of slavery a paradoxically humanitarian act for a state which elsewhere in Africa was engaging in genocide and whose German ally would soon be using the slave labor of millions of Jews, Poles, Czechs, Russians and other subject peoples across Central and Eastern Europe to drive its war economy. The British government made it clear to Selassie that this abolition needed to continue once he was restored to power and that he would have to take concerted steps to make a reality of that abolition. A decree was issued by the emperor to that effect in 1942, from which date we might say that slavery was finally abolished in Ethiopia. Though the East Africa campaign had resulted in a significant victory for the Allies in 1941, it took four more years for the Second World War to end in the defeat of Nazi Germany and its allies. When it did, the League of Nations was succeeded by the United Nations, which Ethiopia became a charter member of in 1948. Selassie had gained favorable consideration for his nation when it came to the settlement of East Africa in the aftermath of the conflict when the Ogaden region was granted to Ethiopia a region which had long been disputed by the Italians, British and Abyssinia prior to the war. Selassie's main concern during these years was to continue the modernization of his country. Considerable strides had been made in doing so in the 1920s and 1930s, but there were still deeply entrenched vested interests in the country within the nobility and the church, which were resistant to too much change occurring too rapidly. Selassie was determined to accelerate the pace of change as the war came to an end in the mid-1940s. Eventually, this would result in 1955 with a revised constitution, which moved beyond the Constitution of 1931 and incorporated elements of the U.S. Constitution. However, in practice, the election of parliamentary delegates remained in the hands of the nobility and other powerful bodies, and Ethiopia certainly did not become a Western-style democracy under Selassie's rule in the post-war years. Many controversial issues began to arise in Ethiopia in the post-war period, particularly so during the 1950s. One of these concerned one of the former Italian colonies, Eritrea. This small northern neighbor of Ethiopia's had been placed under British administration following the conclusion of the East Africa campaign in 1941. In the aftermath of the war, the Allied powers were in favor of Ethiopia's claims to Eritrea, though a small section of the west of the colony was to be joined to British Sudan. Accordingly, when British rule of Eritrea came to an end in the early 1950s, the country was joined with Ethiopia. But this was to be a federal union in which Eritrea retained its own identity and had certain devolved powers held in the hands of its own government. Selassie, though, was determined to bring Eritrea, which provided Ethiopia with access to the Red Sea, under greater centralized control. To this end, in 1962, he dissolved the independent Eritrean parliament and annexed the country. By that time, the Eritrean Liberation Front, or ELF, an independence movement, had launched an armed struggle against Ethiopian rule. The Eritrean War of Independence would continue for the next 30 years, with the conflict becoming a front in the Cold War as the ELF and other independence movements drifted into the Soviet bloc in order to acquire military aid from the USSR, Cuba and others. 
The Eritrean War of Independence was not the only conflict which Emperor Selassie's government faced. Ethnic tensions were also becoming more severe in the 1950s and 1960s. Ethiopia is a nation with approximately 80 different ethnic groups. The empire had effectively been formed through conquest over several centuries, and this had resulted in many ethnic groups remaining unreconciled to the dominance of Ethiopia, above all by the Oromo and Amhara peoples who made up over half of the country's population. Selassie himself was of Oromo descent. The solution, which was favored by Selassie and the Ethiopian government to this situation in the post-war period, was to foster the concept of ethnic federalism, whereby Ethiopia was divided into over a dozen major provinces in which different ethnicities predominated. However, rather than fixing the ethnic problem, this fueled it, ensuring that many Oromo, Amhara, Tigrayans, Somalis, and others continued to shape their identity around their ethnicities rather than their shared identity as Ethiopians. This was already causing unrest in the country during Selassie's reign, but as we will see, this has been compounded in more recent times. Of all the ethnic peoples of Ethiopia, those who were most antagonistic to the government were the Tigrayans, who constituted a sizable proportion of the overall population, roughly 7 or 8 percent, and were the dominant people in Tigray province in the north of the country. The antipathy of Selassie's government towards the Tigrayans was clear for all to see in the 1950s, as the imperial government persistently neglected the province despite mounting evidence of pressure on its resources and the possibility of famine as a result of the destruction of crops by locusts, drought and disease, outbreaks of smallpox, typhus and other high mortality illnesses. When Tigray eventually did enter famine in 1958, the central government in Addis Ababa did very little to try to relieve the situation, leading to tens of thousands of deaths. Thereafter, a more concerted effort was made in 1959 to address the situation, with Selassie's government being provided with considerable aid from the administration of US President Dwight Eisenhower. Nevertheless, by the time the worst of the famine subsided in 1961, it is estimated that about 100,000 people had died in Tigray and surrounding regions, while renewed famine struck northern Ethiopia again in the mid-1960s. While Selassie's reign was increasingly being blackened by controversies at home, including famine in Tigray, a war of independence in Eritrea, and ethnic tensions within Ethiopia, Selassie and, by extension, Ethiopia continued to hold a position of considerable international respect. As one of the world's longest-serving heads of state, he was usually afforded a position of considerable preeminence at major international events, such as the funeral of President John F. Kennedy in Washington, D.C. in 1963, and of the former French President Charles de Gaulle in France in 1970. Ethiopia also supplied peace contingents to many areas of conflict, such as the Congo in the early 1960s, and became a prominent nation within the non-aligned movement of nations which were not members of either NATO or the Warsaw Pact, the respective military alliances of the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Perhaps most significant of all in terms of international diplomacy at this time was Selassie's leading role in the establishment of the Organization of African Unity in 1963, the forerunner of the African Union. The headquarters of the Organization of African Unity was located in Addis Ababa for many years, under Selassie's rule. Not only did Selassie continue to enjoy a vaunted reputation on the international stage in the second iteration of his reign after the Second World War, but he was viewed by many as a messianic character. In the 1930s, a new quasi-religion and social movement emerged in parts of Africa and the Caribbean, one which mixed elements of the Back to Africa movement, which proclaimed that people of African descent in the Americas would wish to return to the African continent now that slavery was at an end, and also Ethiopianism, a branch of Christian worship which had arisen in the late 19th century amongst African Christians, one which looked to the Ethiopian church as a native Christian church within Africa, rather than having African Christians take their directives from European religious leaders in Rome, Canterbury or elsewhere. 
This new movement combines specific belief in elements of biblical theology and a wide array of different social beliefs. It took its name from Selassie's regent title, dating from the 1920s, Rastafari. Thus, the new religion was known as Rastafarianism, and proponents of it viewed Selassie as a messiah, one who may be the second coming of Christ. These views must be understood in light of Ethiopia's position as the only African state which resisted colonial conquest in the 19th century. Selassie did not explicitly seek to be recognized as a messianic character within Rastafarianism, but he also did not attempt to refute efforts to exalt him in this way. Thus, as Rastafarianism gained in popularity in the 1950s in countries like Jamaica, Selassie took on an unusual significance for many people who had never been anywhere near Ethiopia. In contrast to the view of him within Rastafarianism as a quasi-messianic figure, Haile Selassie was actually becoming more oppressive at home in Ethiopia. The last 20 or so years of his reign saw the development of elements of a police state in the country. There were reasons for Selassie's increasing concern about the security of his position. In 1960, while the emperor was on a state visit to Brazil, elements from the Kebur Zabagna, the imperial bodyguard, had attempted a coup d'etat back in Ethiopia. Led by the brothers Germane and Mengustu Newe, the insurrectionists had proclaimed Selassie's son and heir, the crown prince Asfar Wassen, as the new emperor. The prince appears to have been held captive, but how complicit he might have been in the coup attempt remains unclear to this day. In any event, after four days of violence in and around Addis Ababa in mid-December, resulting in over 300 deaths, the attempted overthrow of the emperor had been suppressed and the leaders were killed. Nevertheless, the 1960 attempted coup was significant in the development of a more repressive authoritarian regime in Ethiopia under Selassie in the 1960s and into the 1970s. Hand in hand with the development of this more authoritarian streak in Ethiopian politics was a growing disdain for human rights in the country. In the 1960s, as student protest movements emerged and as communism gained favor in some circles, Selassie's regime dealt ever more frequently in mass arrests and the disappearance of political opponents. The press was widely censored, and intimidation of groups which questioned Selassie and the government was widespread by the 1960s. Compounding matters was the war in Eritrea, where the Imperial Ethiopian Army was engaging in civilian atrocities by the late 1960s. For instance, in December 1970, over 800 civilians were killed by Selassie's forces when they attacked the village of Ona. Moreover, at Hazimo in July 1967, over 170 men were killed by Ethiopian soldiers. Admittedly, some of these atrocities appear not to have been state-ordered, but the war in Eritrea was ultimately of Selassie's making. Unsurprisingly, by the early 1970s, despite the general positive view of Selassie internationally, civil rights groups such as Freedom House were declaring that Ethiopia was moving towards being a repressive authoritarian regime where human rights were being contravened. By the early 1970s, Selassie's rule and government was becoming increasingly unpopular among substantial sections of the population of Ethiopia. He still garnered support amongst traditional groups such as the church and the nobility, who had much to lose if the old imperial order was overthrown, but many others had no affinity for the ancient ruling dynasty. This disaffection was further compounded in 1972 by the onset of a new severe famine in Ethiopia. This time it was centered on Wolo province in the north of the country, near Tigray. This was brought on by drought and was compounded by an inadequate government response and a failure to import extra foodstuffs and deliver them to the affected areas. It is estimated that between 40,000 and 80,000 people died in Wolo and the adjoining regions in the course of 1972 and 1973, while the competition for resources exacerbated ethnic tensions here between groups such as the Oromos, Afars and Somalis. What was worse, news soon spread that, at the height of the famine, foodstuffs which were actually being successfully produced in Wallow were being exported out of the region to Addis Ababa and other parts of Ethiopia. 
Eventually, the unrest at Selassie's reign began to boil over. Perhaps this was unsurprising. In 1972, as famine was gripping Wallow, the emperor had turned 80 years of age. He had been in power, in one form or another, for over half a century, albeit as regent for the first 10 or so years and with a hiatus between 1936 and 1941. The first signs of disturbance arose in January 1974 when garrison soldiers in the town of Negeli Borana mutinied over a lack of clean drinking water and poor paying conditions. In a symbolic gesture, they detained one of their commanding officers, Lieutenant General Derese Dubale, and made show of him having to drink the water they were forced to consume. This resonated with many across Ethiopia, who were disgruntled at the rigid social structure which prevailed in the country, and the perception of there being an elite of individuals who were connected to Selassie's regime. In early February, as news of the mutiny spread, protests and insurrectionary movements developed across the country. Crucially, many elements within the military and the police services joined the disturbances. This augured ill for Selassie, whose grip on power, like any authoritarian ruler, could only be maintained so long as the military and security forces remained loyal. By early March, Selassie was under sufficient pressure that he made a number of announcements that political concessions would be made to make ministers and senior government officials more accountable to the parliament. Moreover, the 1955 constitution would be re-evaluated to see how Ethiopia's politics could be made more inclusive of different groups within the empire. Yet, these compromises failed to stem the tide of unrest. Instead, labor unions called for general strike action across the country in March 1974, and early in April, the significant Muslim minority in the country began agitating for greater religious freedoms. By that time, elements of the military were evidently in charge of much of the running of the government, and Selassie was losing control of the situation. However, it was not until June that the infamous Dirk was set up. This was officially known as the Provisional Military Administrative Council and consisted of relatively low-ranking army officers and officials who effectively seized power in the summer of 1974. That summer, they began a campaign of arrests of prominent political figures and issued a manifesto of proposed reforms. Finally, on the 12th of September 1974, 44 years after he first became emperor and nearly six decades since his accession to a position of preeminence in Ethiopian politics, the Derg deposed Emperor Haile Selassie. Following his deposition, Selassie was placed under house arrest. His son, Crown Prince Asfar Wassen, who had been proclaimed as emperor by the leaders of the failed coup of 1960, was now again proclaimed by the Derg. He was not in Ethiopia at the time and decreed that his father's deposition and the actions of the Provisional Military Administrative Council in proclaiming him as emperor were illegitimate. Accordingly, in March 1975, the Derg abolished the Ethiopian monarchy altogether, bringing the empire to an end and ushering in the creation of a new Ethiopian state. Meanwhile, the new military junta had spent much of the winter of 1974 and the spring of 1975 overseeing the execution of hundreds of those who were associated with the old imperial regime. This included some collateral members of the imperial family, notably Iskander Desta, a grandson of Selassie's, who had also been a prominent figure within the Ethiopian navy. The signs for the former emperor were ominous, and several months later, on the 28th of August 1975, state media announced that Selassie had died the previous day, the 27th of August. The official cause of death at 83 years of age was given as respiratory failure, but Selassie had almost certainly been strangled to death by Derg soldiers. His remains were interred under a concrete slab in the grounds of the Imperial Palace in Addis Ababa. They were only finally removed in 1992 and placed in Holy Trinity Cathedral in Addis Ababa, near those of his auspicious predecessor, Emperor Menelik II. By the time Selassie was killed, Ethiopia had descended into a long civil war from which it would not emerge until the early 1990s. The Derg established Ethiopia as a Soviet-aligned country, espousing Marxist-Leninist principles in the mid-1970s. 
It was opposed by rival revolutionary groups such as the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party and the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Compounding matters was the ongoing War of Independence in Eritrea, and from 1977 onwards, a further regional conflict as Ethiopia found itself at war with Somalia over possession of the province of Ogaden. In this morass of political conflicts, political violence amplified across the country, with tens of thousands being killed in the Red Terror unleashed by the Derg regime in the second half of the 1970s. By the 1980s, the Ethiopian civil war was made even more traumatic by the arrival of new famines, the biggest wave coming between 1983 and 1985, in which upwards of half a million people perished. The fighting only eventually came to a conclusion in 1991, once the collapse of the Soviet Union ended the flow of weaponry into the Horn of Africa. By the time it ended, nearly one and a half million people had died from the combined effects of military conflict, disease and famine. The end of the Ethiopian civil war in 1991 brought about a brief respite from the country's woes. A new constitution was established in the mid-1990s, while Eritrea finally gained its independence after three decades of fighting. There were then efforts to create an ethno-territorial federal state, where different ethnic groups had control over different provinces of the country where they were dominant. However, renewed problems soon arose. A new war erupted with Eritrea in 1998. The initial fighting ceased in 2000, but border tensions and intermittent conflict have remained a perennial problem in northern Ethiopia. Internally, Ethiopia's efforts to resolve its ethnic tensions by creating a federal state have largely failed. In particular, the government's antagonism towards the Tigray minority in northern Ethiopia, which is a deep-rooted legacy of Selassie's time as emperor, has come to international attention in recent years. In 2020, the Ethiopian federal government effectively initiated a war against Tigray, one which is ongoing as of late 2022, and which has resulted in war crimes, mass famine, and behavior by the government which many international observers see as genocidal. Thus, while Ethiopia is viewed as having the potential to become a major economic and political power in East Africa, as Africa experiences considerable economic expansion in the 21st century, the structural problems of the country, which were not only left unresolved by Selassie, but exacerbated, remain a grave problem in the Horn of Africa. Emperor Haile Selassie was a paradoxical character in 20th century history. On the one hand, in the first half of his reign, he made major advances in modernizing Ethiopia even before he became emperor himself, while in the 1930s he emerged as a figurehead in opposition to the rise of fascism and brutality as the Italians invaded and conquered his nation. This reputation as a leading statesman was cemented in the aftermath of the Second World War when he forged an independent stance on the world stage and was also well regarded for his suppression of slavery in Ethiopia. Overlying all of this is the most unusual position which he has acquired as a messianic character within Rastafarianism. However, Selassie also had many things which stand against him. His reign became increasingly autocratic in his later years, and there were manifold human rights abuses committed at home in Ethiopia between the 1950s and 1970s. Eventually, these resulted in revolution and his overthrow. Additionally, his handling of Eritrea's position resulted in a war which persisted for 30 years and after Selassie's own time. However, perhaps Selassie's greatest crime was in failing to reconcile the ethnic and religious differences of his nation during his long reign as both regent and emperor, which lasted over half a century. This failure has cast a long shadow over modern Ethiopia and continues to create problems in the Horn of Africa today. What do you think of Emperor Haile Selassie? Do you think his deposition by the Italians in the 1930s created undue sympathy for him, which has caused popular opinion to overlook his own crimes? Please let us know in the comments section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.